In the 1600s, Europeans arriving from across the Atlantic found a new world with vast forests, fertile land, food from the sea, and of course communities of people. The new settlers needed a source of mechanical power to saw logs and grind grain, but immense water power resources also abounded. I'm Dean Rikerson, president of Tide Mill Institute, here to explore the remnants of tide milling in the town of York, Maine, starting at the site near Beach Ridge Road. Let's go back to early Maine, even before the time when Massachusetts took over the province. Sir Fernando Gorges claimed the New World lands north of Piscataqua. He never actually visited his estate, but in 1634, he did have the foresight to send John Ingleby Sawyer and Bartholomew Bernard on the Pied Cow to erect water-powered grist and sawmills. They brought tools, parts, and millstones from England. They may have chosen this site for a manageable tide near the York River, which would allow transportation of logs, lumber, and grain. Remember, there were no roads. The historic record shows a lot of breakdowns of mill machinery and the dam itself. Massachusetts annexed the Gorges Grant in 1652, and sometime before 1653, the mill was abandoned, nearly 307 years ago. Ingleby and Bernard were given land for their service in mill construction, so they moved to Boston. York was left without a mill. For most of human history, there were only two forms of mechanical energy available, people's muscles and animals' muscles. Several thousand years ago, people harnessed the power of moving air and moving water to transfer those natural powers for use in grinding grain or sawing stone. Mills on streams depended on rain, but ocean tides were more dependable and they were more powerful. Thus, tide mills, which have probably been around since Roman times, came into being. Through the years, there may have been as many as 10,000 stream and river mills in Europe and America. Maybe only a thousand or so tide mills, however. The Tide Mill Institute a Maine-based research and educational institution has been studying tide mills for nearly two decades, and we've documented more than 200 of them in Maine alone. Early American tide mills displayed the ingenuity of settlers who brought the technology from Europe in their heads and hearts. How do tide mills work? It's really simple. At an inlet or estuary, a dam would have been constructed to capture the incoming tide, a gate open to admit it. When the area behind the dam filled and the tide began to ebb, it closed the gate. The tide lowered outside below the level of the trapped water. And then water from the higher level would be fed through a sluice way and aimed at a wheel or a turbine. And the falling water turned the wheel. And in the mill, that tremendous mechanical energy was transferred to a saw blade or a grinding stone or a trip hammer. And the tide mill was doing its work grinding grain, sawing lumber, or pounding, just like mills on streams or rivers. Steam eventually took over these jobs, and tide mills became a thing of the past. Well, other than fish, timber was what Maine had to offer to England, which didn't have so many trees by the 18th or 17th century. And so um, uh, 
you know, timber and sawmills was the big money maker, and it really sustained the community for a very long time. Not just, you know, what you would cut down and send off in a ship to England, but also how uh, how you built buildings here. Um, it was interesting because there was a particular type of plank wall construction that was really common in Maine the, and New Hampshire and northern Massachusetts that you really don't see a whole lot in other places. But, you know, instead of having stud walls or timber framing, they would have two inch thick oak planks that formed the structure box of a house. And, um, um, but, you know, aside from that kind of practical use of the timber, uh, one of the earliest, if not about the earliest tide mill was on Old Mill Creek in, in what is now York. And it was across the York River from Point Christian, which was Fernando Gorgeous, the proprietor of Maine's um, kind of administrative center. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting that every little tributary into the York River had a tide mill on it. And about the last one was the one at Barrel Mill Pond in the middle of York, which I, dates to the 1720s. Um, that was such a wide span, they needed to get investors to have the resources to build it. But that was really the last one because everything else already had a tide mill. And it was um, all a result of the natural resource of timber and then the ability to efficiently cut it up and make it into planks that could be used. Ted Baker, you are an authority on early <laughs> colonial America and technology and how it's used and society and you've done a lot of archaeology in this area yep. which is fantastic and I'm always amazed at what you've turned up. So, <laughs> Well you know uh, living and working in York and York County uh, the, we have such an amazing historical and, arche and ar archaeological architectural heritage as you know yeah. that um, it's, it's a wonderful place I feel kind of privileged to work here in a place like the York River which is uh, s full of so many really interesting I important early early tide mill sites yeah so let's talk about what may very well be have been yep. the first tide mill in the colonies right um, right here in York in, in theory, right, Old Mill Creek, 1634, um, and of course there's some kind of debate about this because, um, you know, for a long time I, there's been the debate between between South Berwick and York over who has the first mill, because of course the hardware for both mills came over on the ship the Pied Cow in 1634, and at the time Sir Ferdinando Gorgeous, who was the proprietor of Maine, uh, and his partner John Mason, who was in hopes to becoming the proprietor of New Hampshire, would, it, Never got that, unfortunately, never got that paperwork signed before he died. So, um, and that's another story, Dean. But anyhow, um, they both, of course, uh, had workings for, for, for mills brought over. And uh, the same boat bringing both. And uh, the, 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 um, uh, the Mason's Mill was put on the Great Works, what's now called the Great Works River in South Berwick. And Gorges had his mill built. Uh, near to the land that he owned in York on what's now called Old Mill Creek. Um, and of course there's a huge rivalry debate between the two communities as to who had the first uh, the first mill and the first dam. And the way I like to sort of solve it is, well, you know, South Berwick had the first gravity powered and York had the first tidal mill. Um, now having said that, you have to, uh, there, there are a couple other sort of claimants though to the sort of tidal when we're talking about like uh, in English America or in North America, right? Because um, we do know that in the 1620s there was some kind of sawmill built on the James River, um, near the James River in Virginia. Um, we don't know enough about that to say what it was. Uh, if you've ever been to the James River, you probably find it hard to believe it could be a tidal mill, frankly, mm. because there's not much tidal drawdown there. It's such a huge river, you know. Mm -hmm. um, though um, earlier than that, in 1612, there is what we believe is the first mill built in, in English North America, which would have been a sawmill built in, in Newfoundland at uh, at Cooper's Cove or Cooper's Colony, um, which was the first original settlement in New Hampshire. And to me that's a particularly interesting site because uh, in 1615 
who becomes the governor of that colony, a young fellow named John Mason. So yeah, the new uh, coming to uh, the colonies to uh, North America and the difference between Old England and uh, where there was plenty of labor and the New World where there's plenty of trees and not many people. That's right. So you really, and, and the people who come over here, um, a lot of times they'll be indentured servants who come over under contracts of anywhere from five to seven years to to work for somebody and then after that time is up there free and over here after that you're not going to want to work for someone else you're going to be able to get your own land and that's terribly exciting in England most of these people who are coming over are very much you know aside from from like the the rich folk who run the colony most of the workers are from very working class backgrounds would never the thought of owning land let alone a farm of 50 or 100 acres was just beyond their wildest dreams. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to keep that sort of labor and who wants to be a, a poor sawyer when you can make lots of money uh, trading furs or becoming a cod fisherman and uh, as opposed to like the, really the back-breaking work of, of hauling lumber and, and, and cutting down trees. So um, you really do need ways to save labor, right? And, and these sawmills really are that answer. But I think the problem is, you know, um, this was not a, a tried and true technology that was that, uh, in England, so we don't have you know mill engineers and carpenters who really know how to build these things, and I think that explains particularly why these these earliest ones, particularly the one that Gorgeous builds at Old Mill Creek, why um, it didn't hold up very well and didn't last very long. And they had a supply chain problem in that they couldn't make anything <laughs> in in the colonies. Yes, and everything had to be brought by ship. Yeah, that's that's the the uh, incredible thing if you think about it. Remember, you know, they really at this point in the 1630s, they didn't um, <laughs> they, they they didn't have any sort of blacksmith shop to speak of here, and if they did, it was very basic, but certainly not the kind of shop where you can make like the specialized hardware that you would need. And we, we actually are, are, are lucky because we do have the surviving letter book written by Thomas Gorgias, who was a, a kinsman of Sir Ferdinando, who came over in 1642 York, uh, then called Gorgiana, actually in honor of the family. And um, he's the deputy governor, the acting governor. And he writes letters back to Sir Ferdinando and other folks, and he's constantly complaining about the state of the mills, that uh, the dam isn't in good shape, that the footings are not well built, and whenever a piece of metal breaks on it, they essentially have to ship back to England, and it takes at least two or three months for the letter to get there. Depending on what time of year it is, if it's late fall, the, you may not be able to have a ship come back with a new part until the following spring. So it can be as much as like a six month or a year turnaround between darn the mill's broken and we have the piece to fix it. And then too, again, all of this is very early, primitive in that sense, you know, first generation technology. And you have someone back in England trying to make a new part for you. For you. How well will it be made? How exactly does it fit? How good are the mechanics over here to try to make it work? And um, at one point, Gorgeous says he really can't get anybody else to even try to work on the mill because all of those who've done that, you know, have just have given up on it, right? So um, it's, you really, you need that infrastructure. So it's, it's not only supply chain issues, but also skilled technology and skilled workers who understand these things and know how to fix them. Because again, this is, so, you know, in that, in that sense, you're, you're a long way from home when you're really trying this new technology out, right? So that, that first mill you think is, is uh, purely a sawmill? Well, um, Gorgeous also does make mention to corn mill. Oh. Okay. And he says, says specifically, but he says, you know, um, it's working so poorly at one point that they can barely, you know, grind like two, couple of bushels of grain a tide. So um, it's certainly, we know that uh, at some point on that dam, by the time Gorges is, is there, uh, there, there are, is both a corn mill and a grist mill. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I believe, and I think Bob Gordon, who you know you're talking to, who knows m more about this than I do, it sounds like that the, the, the thinking is that the, the, the northern end, there were two cuts through the dam, which you can still really sort of see today, and that the northern one would have been where the sawmill was, and that the southern one would have been where the grist mill was. We also know that somewhere upriver at some point there was a fulling mill as well that came along, I think, in the 18th century. Mm. So it's hard for us to imagine if you look at that stretch of river today, which is uh, Old Mill Creek and New Mill Creek, which is pretty rural with some pretty houses on the banks, it's hard to think of that as being sort of the, the industrial heartland that, you know, the Upper York River, the industrial heartland of America in the 1630s, but it really was a quite a community of, of workers and, and mills, both on Old Mill Creek and then, of course, 
across the York River, what will later be called New Mill Creek, where they're building more mills in the 1650s. Yeah, so it's the 1600s industrial park. So. Absolutely, I mean, or in part of it, right? Because as we know very quickly, we have other mills along the York River in the in the 1600s as well. One, one downriver down towards the the golf course, right? That I, right. I'm sure you're aware of, and another one I think I was that I was mentioning to you that is way up on on Smelt Brook beyond the partings on the York River, where in 1699 there was a, a sawmill built. So, and and and, it, and probably some others as well. You know, I honestly I um. I've said this in the past, actually, to, to Bud, it's that it seems to me that if you look at a, at a map of southern coastal Maine, below the fall line, any time you look at a map and see an old road, um, and if that road's still there, you're, you, and there's a, there's, a bridge, there's a bridge there, and that bridge is going over the remains of an old tidal mill from, from the colonial era, that they really were almost everywhere, right? That yeah. any, yeah. any, and and it, what amazes me is how much work must have they must have gone into to build these dams and to try to maintain them when you realize how relatively little power they produce and if you also then realize how relatively little wood there is to cut because if you look at a place like old mill creek or you know dolly gordon brook as it's known now yeah. um, that doesn't have a huge watershed and uh, if you have a good crew of, of lumbermen they could probably clear cut to, you know, uh, to within, let's put it this way, far enough inland to which, you know, you, you, to drag the logs to the water in a few years. You know, you're not talking about something that it was, uh, and th this was not, this was not uh, sustainable forestry they were practicing either, right? This is, I, I love that phrase, Jeff Bolster, professor at UNH and a friend, he calls this America's first clear cut. Mm. And because if, if you think of, so if you think about this, when you're building, to what degree when you build a mill in 1634, how long could you have actually literally expected there to be enough logs even to keep that in operation if it was working well, right? Um, if you think about this too as it being a seasonal operation, um, not like today where you're working 24-7, but the mills, the tides, right, the seasonality, this is something that you do in different times of the year when you're not planting crops, when you're not tending to harvest. So part of this natural rhythm of life too, right? That it wasn't like you wouldn't have had people who were, for the most part, who were full-time professional millers. Or if you were, you also had to tend to your livestock and your, and, and your garden and, and all that as well too. Because people, and most people in Maine in the 1600s were, were not overly specialized, just let's say, right? But on the other hand, the grist mills or the corn mills are, 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 are a community center in a yes. way. Because, yeah. because it's very necessary throughout the year, right? Right. You know, I mean, that's kind of, there's a, the, 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 absolutely the, the corn mills, and, and frankly, though, even to a lesser degree, the, the sawmills are too, and there's, um, you know, there have been some studies in this years ago on the locations of sawmills in, and this was more like, I think, in, in rural Massachusetts, we're not talking about tidal mills here, but where the sawmill was located was invariably in close relationship to where the town kind of developed. Mm. And you even see it here um, in, in these early communities where, uh, for example, you know, the, the um, the Chadbourne Mill in South Berwick, um, the mill on the Falls of the Saco. These are public privileges that are granted to men, in this case, most in the 1640s and 1650s. But these, again, all of these, the grist mills and the sawmills are, um, while they're businesses, they're also a, a necessity for a community to survive. You have to have a corn mill to grind your corn. And, and honestly, you don't, okay, you don't have to have a sawmill, right? You can have a sawyer. You can hand, and, and most of the, the beams are still being hand hewn, but the amount of, 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 of time saving and how much easier it is to build a house, clearly this is something where the town wants to grant that land to somebody, really at no cost, okay, on the condition that you will build a sawmill, that you will build a grist mill, and usually in that, well, if you read the town records, there'll be some kind of stipulation as to what the, the rate is that they will charge per board foot or for or for for peck of corn or Regulated, something. Regulated, huh? Yeah, no, it, yes, absolutely. Well, because again, too, like, because you were allowing, think about this, by our standards, you were really kind of allowing a monopoly, right? In most towns, there wouldn't have been more than one or two good mill privileges. So by the town granting that, if they didn't take some steps to control that, then you were kind of granting a monopoly privilege to that. So you wanted to make sure that at least the people in town were getting a reasonable rate on their boards. Now, these same boards are also being cut and are literally going out into the Atlantic world. I mean, that's the amazing thing. You know, if you, if you think about this, it really is these, these sawmills 
that are the kind of that economic engine uh, that, that helps drive the New England economy. It's the, that, it's, the, it's the furs and the fish and the lumber that's going out into the Atlantic world in largely in ships built in New England by wood, you know, cut and sawn by these New England lumbermen and shipbuilders, and then that goes out into the Atlantic world. And it's going to the Caribbean to do what? Well, that's New England's dirty little secret, right? Of course. <laughs> because, because, of course, we're uh, in the Sugar Islands down in the Caribbean, they're clearing every tree, every square foot of land to do what? To plant sugar. sugar. And who's doing the planting and the harvesting? Enslaved people. Enslaved people. And, you know, this is why we see slaves showing up here eventually, too. But essentially, that whole, that whole economy, that what we call the, you know, when we were kids in school, it was called the triangular trade, right? Right, right. And this idea is of how we take our raw materials in New England and turn them into finished goods that come over from England. And the answer is, we are going to support the economy of the Caribbean. We are going to feed the slaves with our refuse cod, right? And they live in houses built of lumber coming from the Piscataqua region and other New England ports. So we're basically sustaining that whole enterprise. And in return, really, you know, New England has this booming economy. So in some degrees to me, these sawmills, you know, you look, look at these, these, these be beautiful bucolic remains of, of sawmills in rural Maine. And again, um, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg of this much more sort of, of this huge Atlantic economy but also this kind of this insidious system of, of slavery is all part of it. That's sort of part of New England's dirty little secret, right? Yeah, that's integral part. And, yeah. Uh, but uh, th this, the saw milling technology even influenced our domestic building um, technology. I mean, Richard Candy's written about how um, in northern New England with this wealth of water energy resources yeah. uh, that sawn lumber and timber is much more used in building than there are in southern New England where it's a lot of hand-hewn building. Yes. Yeah. It's funny, Richard's a neighbor and we were actually talking this morning <laughs> about this very same subject of like, you know, hewing versus versus sawing. And, you know, we can actually, there's a, um, a building we're studying in, in Elliott, the old Frost Garrison, actually has boards in it for the floorboards on the second floor of the garrison that are, I believe, 32 feet long. And they're all pit sawn because a sawmill carriage is not that long right. to even saw a board that length. So even in places around here, I think a lot of it depends on where you are in town, where the nearest sawmill is that you can gain access to, and so, um, and, and also to what you're charging, right? Because again, uh, the board footage for timber, if it's going down to the Caribbean, you can see on all these accounts and court cases what, what the rates are per, per, per board foot. And, uh, you know, if you're some local kid trying to build a, a home for your, for your wife and kids, you may not be able to afford the, 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 the stuff either because, that, it, you know, it's all sort of supply and demand, right? And who's going to pay the most for, for that lumber? and, and, and market it, economy, right? Right. And also, too, it's like, and if you're downriver of that sawmill, it's a lot easier to get at than, than, and then if you're upriver, right? So right. there's those kinds of issues as well, too. And, you know, and of course, as you know, the problem is we only have, like, this much of a sort of historical record for this, right? Okay, so we got a dam that was <laughs> not well built and not in not in a good place. That's right. And falling apart and continual mechanical problems. Yes, and uh, Sir Ferdinand of Gorges at this point, uh, the, in 1642, the Civil War breaks out in England, and he's a supporter of the king. Short the short story is the war does not go well for the king, and. Um, Really, uh, Gorges dies about the time the Civil War ends and, and the, the king's beheaded. And that's kind of the end of Gorges, the Gorges family effort here. Um, so we know at least probably for a generation or more, that site will, will, will sit unused. So uh, New Mill Creek was uh, what's now called Cider Hill Creek. And it was really the opposite, sort of like an intersection on the York River, Old Mill Creek on the south bank, New Mill Creek on the north. In the 1650s, the, uh, Henry Sayward built his sawmill on New Mill Creek. Um, and, and again, that seems to have been in operation for, for a while, um, probably burnt down in the raid on York in 1692. Um, and again, you can imagine this, when, when, when Maine was destroyed several times in these, in these conflicts with the Native Americans, King Philip's War and King William's War, one of the big targets actually for the Native Americans were things like sawmills. Because uh, they understood economic warfare as well as we did. If you burn down someone's sawmill, they may go away, they may not come back, right? Um, so um, there's a, a, a fellow who actually, uh, 
About 1697 gets permission from the town of York, Captain Pickering from Portsmouth, to rebuild a mill on New Mill Creek. And apparently within a few years, by around 1700, or 1707 at the latest, he has built a new mill on Old Mill Creek, right? And kind of the big question that we were discussing earlier was like, the locations, the fact that there's two dams there, and which one was it? And I think it's fairly clear by how well built it is, and also looking at later maps, that Pickering's Mill was that one was the, the, the furthest downriver on, on, on Old Mill Creek. Is the where remains are the, the best. I mean. Absolutely. Well preserved, lots of stonework still there, as opposed to the one that's about 100 yards upriver that is heavily eroded seems to be made out of much smaller stones and frankly in my mind lines up with this thing that Thomas Gorges is complaining about like you know not really that well built can't keep it in repair it keeps on sinking <laughs> sort of sort of very much like that and so we know that that, that Pickering um, rebuilds the, the mill there and we also know um, I've done some archaeological work nearby where we found the the remains of a, of, of a cellar hole of the homestead of, of, of Robert Gray who um, was uh, uh, a man who was a, a, a professional sawmiller, and he built a house on the land with his house on the, on the north side of Old Mill Creek, um, on the part of the land that, that became part of the Barrel Grove Farm later on. And he um, built a house there in 1707, and for close to the next uh, 20 years, I think until about 17, actually 1723 or 24, um, he would have lived right there with his family and would have, uh, presumably, would have been operating the sawmill as well, too. And, and then you referenced him moving to uh, Cape Nettick Mill? Yeah, yeah. Um, and is that, is that a gravity mill, do you think, or a... Well, that's hard to say. If it's, well, the, the, the main mills at, at Cape Nettick were at the falls, which is today just below Route 1. Right. So, I, and I think as, that was, as far as I know, those were the principal mills at Cape Nettick, and it would have been more of a gravity-powered mill. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in that sense, I mean, the gravity-powered ones are kind of more reliable, right? Um, you never know, um, I mean, different, but it's also different times of the year. Yeah. There's only certain, certain months of the year we, when you, we can use that. And, it, so, and these guys, but these guys seem to have sort of moved around. And uh, in some cases, and also Robert Gray was a second generation sawmill man. His, um, his father was George Gray, who was one of the Scottish prisoners of war taken captive at the Battle of Dunbar mm. in 1650, and were shipped over to New England uh, as forced labor on indentured servant contracts. And they were uh, sort of uh, jobbed out of uh, the Saugus Ironworks, and a lot of them ended up here in the Piscataqua region um, in um, Kittery, York, what's now South Berwick, over in Durham, New Hampshire, where they were the hard labor of the lumber industry and the sawmills. Uh, and, and again, to like, you know, if you, uh, someone who's indentured doesn't have much choice as to what they're going to do for work. You have to work for your term of your indenture or face some pretty serious consequences. So these guys kind of powered the sawmilling industry. And it's interesting to me how many of these, these guys, like George Gray, not only were involved in this, but then you see descendants also being involved in, in lumbering operations hmm. as well, too, yeah. Wow. So, we're back on New Mill Creek. New Mill Creek. <laughs> so, on, on, on New Mill Creek again, too, we know, you know, it's, um, the, the, the remains of these, these mills actually on both New Mill Creek and Old Mill Creek were apparently used, you know, throughout the 19th century. But it's clear that people keep on reusing these mills, reusing the mill sites. Mm. Uh, in that sense, they sort of create an archaeological puzzle because obviously these things need a lot of repair and rebuilding. Um, and of course, every time you have a freshet, you lose the mill itself. You have to rebuild that and the mill ends up being washed downstream. Um, but this seems to be an industry uh, in, in places like, like the York River that is in operation you know, throughout much, much of the 19th century. And, um, and again, to me, that's why, you know, kind of like when I first started looking at these sites here in the 1980s, I kind of felt like, like time had stopped, right? You, you visit these sites and you see how amazingly well-preserved these remains are. You understand that these, people, these things were constantly being repaired, maintained, washed out in a flood, rebuilt um, for, for several hundred years by, by, by many, many generations of, of, of residents of, of York and these coastal communities. Preserved by use, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the mills, uh, sawmills and baths, they were operating until 1900. I mean, yeah. I see, I see in houses, Victorian houses in Boston, 
you can see the stamp of those of those mills. All those, those like those win against all the win against the win mills, against right? Mills, yes. yeah. yeah, it was incredible. And of course, we didn't have any sort of accumulation like that here. But um, you know, all you have to do is look at that map of the Piscataqua drawn in the 1660s. Right. It's this beautiful map of the region of the Piscataqua, and it actually ends with the York to the east. But it's, uh, there's a there's a uh, a key on the left, and it basically is a key showing the locations of sawmills. And essentially, this whole map is being shown to show you that, yep, there were like a, at least a dozen sawmills in the Piscataqua region in that time period. And then again, this is that sort of this is first period. For, yeah, absolutely. And this is this is what is sort of uh, that that boom to the economy of the region, and and again a good source of employment, especially for the for the young for the young boys just starting out in life. We'll we'll put them to work in the sawmills, and hopefully they'll 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 wise up and and go find a better sort of lifetime occupation than saw than sawing boards. But for sometimes too, for some guys it becomes a very prosperous career path as well too. You know, working with the merchants and being part of the whole merchant industry. Yeah, so Bob Gordon, resident of New York. Yes. A uh, geophysicist from Yale University, and yeah. uh, you've done a lot of things in archaeology and all different fields. So uh, we're here to talk to you about sawmills in, in the, the colonial America. In England, uh, sawing was mostly done by hand because the sawyers, in effect, had a union and they didn't want mechanization. So um, when people arrived here and you've got a shortage of manpower, naturally you wanted to mechanize the sawing because it's very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, technique was to use pit saws if you wanted to make boards. And in a pit saw, the uh, uh, top sawyer stands on top of the logs. The logs are on a trestle. And the bottom sawyer, called the pitman, stands in a pit underneath. And the top sawyer guides the saw, the pitman pulls it down, standing in this shower of sawdust. Yeah. A pretty miserable job. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of pull-ups. <laughs> it is a lot of pull-ups. So naturally, it was really nice to have a sawmill do it for you with water power. Yeah. And so that's why water power, along with grinding grain, were two of the things that were really important uh, in the early settlements. We're not really sure about the location of that 1634 mill. We are not. <laughs> and it could be the same location as the later mill, yep. or uh, it could be in a different location, but the, uh, we know that it was not very well placed and not very well engineered because it, it failed didn't, so many It didn't times. last. Yeah. Uh, presumably, well, think of the problem. You've got these two guys that come over with a boatload of mill parts to essentially a wilderness where there's no help, there's no stores, there's no blacksmith, and you got to bring everything you need, and millstones, metalwork, and so on. Actually, it's probably amazing that it worked as well as it did. <laughs> that it worked at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did. I mean, yeah. they did succeed in sawing. Yeah, yeah. Sure, and grinding. Yeah. Right. So, um, so that, yeah. we know that that was a, um, a dual function mill at that time, that first mill, do you think? Uh, both sawing and milling? Or? Um, yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, but now, is there actual physical evidence of that? Um, probably not, since we don't have any real physical evidence of, uh, of that dam or what was there. Right. So you have to go by records. Yeah. And the records, I think, are pretty clear that there was both sawing and milling. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm sure that's the case. The reason we know is, of course, that uh, Thomas Gorges, the uh, nephew of the proprietor back in England, yeah. was sent over here as the deputy governor of the province of Maine. And uh, Thomas wrote back regularly to his uncle and uh, the family about all his problems. And uh, one of the neat things that's uh, in that record is that he describes the uh, number of board feet and the number of bushels of grain that could be ground or sawn in one tide. 
which is the first quantitative data we had on the productivity of those mills. That's uh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, it is. And it's amazing those documents survived because they were I don't know, stored in some outhouse at a mansion uh, near Exeter in England. Mm. Waterlogged, eaten by mice, and so on. Oh, I didn't know they found it in England. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Right. Sure. Huh. So. <clears throat> and then it was until years later that that second mill was, uh, was constructed. Yeah. Tad has the date when the, the um, uh, mills were last seen, and I think it was within, within less than 10 years that the uh, second set of mills was built. And I'm basing that on uh, uh, the paper that Richard Candy wrote about milling. Richard, by the way, lives here in Maine. Yeah. And uh, he is our, our primary source on, uh, on milling in this area. And he's discovered that, uh, that amazing map of uh, showing the, so many mills in uh, New England. Yes. In, 1650, I believe. Right? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, right. So the the new uh, dam, which we see, is very evident and uh, is, is very is very clear, um, which may have been the old dam too. <laughs> yes. In 1654, possibly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think Candy says 1652, but mm. who knows? Yeah. Plus or minus a few years doesn't matter. Well, we can see those three openings in, in that new dam very clearly. Yes. In the drawn photography. Right. And, and that was uh, definitely also a saw and a grist mill. Well, uh, you can question what the evidence for that is. Um, the only evidence I have uh, really is from when uh, Peveril Miggs was visiting. Mm -hmm. And um, he was traveling around with a, uh, I think it was Henry Sayward. He was a uh, descendant of the Saywards, the Sayward clan that were big in milling here. And uh, so his sketch and his conversation, I guess, with um, either Sayward or possibly Ernst. And uh, a Gowan too? Pardon? There's a Gowan, I believe, also. Yeah. Ernst Gowan. Gowan, right. Uh, Gowan was the... Uh, surveyor here in York. Oh, okay. Okay, and he was in an earlier time, so I think the, the uh, thing about Gowan was there was a possibility of visiting his aunt, daughter, mm -hmm. whoever had his, his records, and apparently Gowan had his big hand-colored maps of York, which apparently have disappeared. Wow. Uh, so that, that conversation had to do with visiting him uh, to see those maps. Yeah, and is this the Freeman, you think, um, Mrs. Freeman? Not Mrs. Freeman, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, so well, that that, that's a like mystery that needs to be solved someday. That sounds like something we should dig into, huh? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. It would be great to find there. those. Yeah, yeah. Right. Anyways, um, Sayward, or somebody else he was talking to, said, yes, the sawmill was there, and the gristmill was here, well, the grist mill was definitely there because there's a remains of a millstone there, or there was at that time. Mm -hmm. The sawmill, who knows? I don't think there's any any evidence, but clearly in uh, uh, was it 1652 or whenever it was when they rebuilt the milling industry there, um, that was because people from Massachusetts had taken over Maine. Uh, interesting story there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there were a lot of merchants from Massachusetts coming up here to exploit the wood, the timber. And that was the big export product at that time. So sawmilling was very important. And uh, there is that statement um, in one of those sources, which I don't remember, saying, you know, every stream or trickle that could turn a wheel in York was used for sawmilling. Hmm. So it was a big deal. So yes, it's perfectly reasonable that there were sawmills and grist mills, one of each on that dam. And then the center opening was the tide gate. Right. So, you know, you had 
fill the pond behind the dam as the tide came in and then the gate would shut and then you had to wait until the tide went down enough so that the milk wheels were not backwatered and then you could go to work. So the tricky thing about locating a mill in Old Mill Creek is you have to get a balance between the filling of the pond and the tide getting low enough so you can then run the mill wheel. It works out that about the middle of the creek is the best place for that. And you see this according to my calculations at yes. least. And the assumption it's an undershot wheel, is that correct? Yeah. That's the assumption. Yeah. Uh, almost certainly true. Right. Yeah. So. Given the tide differential. And yes. Right. So um, milling went on there until almost the 20th century. Apparently, it's amazing to think that, you know, as late as 1880, 1890, people were still taking grain to a tide mill to be ground in New York. That's amazing. It is amazing. Just a little more than 100 years ago. That's right. So between that, the time that ended, which was about the beginning of the 20th century, and the time that Megs came to visit, um, that was, what, 70 some odd years. Yeah. Okay. And now it's been an additional 70 years. So he's kind of in the midpoint of that span of experience. And that's why it's really interesting to compare what he saw, what must have been there, and what's there now. And you can see that the, uh, the mill dam in Old Mill Creek is a wasting resource. It's busy disappearing. And uh, I think it must be one of the oldest surviving structures in Maine, man-made structures. It really should be properly recorded. Mm -hmm. It should be a, a, you know, a real proper archaeological project done there before you lose much more of it. <clears throat> With measurements and mapping. And yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Because it's clear from what Meg saw uh, that an uh, awful lot of what was there 70 years ago is gone Yeah, and is going. Um, across the York River, uh, we have New Mill Creek with a series of dams, mills, and various owners that uh, changed and uh, disappeared and came back. And yes, <laughs> right. Um, but, um, <clears throat> and they didn't seem to have lasted as long. They did not. Uh, one of the interesting things about New Mill Creek is, of course, it's on this side of the river. And during the, um, the Indian raid, uh, the mills and a lot of the housing and people uh, around New Mill Creek got wiped out. Whereas Old Mill Creek was on the other side of the river, and the uh, raiders from Quebec didn't get across the river. So they survived. And I think that's one reason why things uh, are less developed, less obvious now in uh, the New Mill Creek area. Hmm. But um, the other problem is that the um, dam remains are, are much less there. You can see that in the satellite images. Um, you can kind of see it in the drone pictures but they're, they're even harder to uh, In fact, I could only see the remains of one of the dams in the drone pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were, were much more obvious when uh, Megs was there, but even at that, that time, they're much less, uh, there's much less survival there than there is in Old Mill Creek. On the other hand, uh, New Mill Creek was where it was convenient to get. So people walked up the road here and kept going without crossing the river, <laughs> without crossing the river yeah. uh, to go to the uh, town supported grist mill which was on New Mill Creek um, in the uh, after the Indian raid and up into uh, early 18th century so um, it's too bad in a way that uh, there's so little survival in the creek because it's uh, certainly an area of importance to the history of the town. So it's interesting that that mill was town supported, uh, like the economy is. The, the, so the grist that, mill was. Yeah, the grist mill. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. The second one that was built uh, after the Indian raid uh, 
was specifically uh, a deal with uh, somebody from Portsmouth who said, yeah, uh, you give me the exclusive milling privileges in York and I'll build the mill. Uh, uh, how long the exclusive milling, milling privileges lasted is a question. I suspect not very long. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, you know what? <clears throat> we should talk about that. Uh, we, we, we have to find that deed. Apparently, there, some owners still have up in their deed some mill rights. Oh, really? An old mill. Crate. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So Jim has visited them, oh. and um, and we have to look at the deed to see the wording. Oh, well, that's neat. <laughs> it's apparently, apparently yeah. still in the deed. Okay. That's neat. <laughs> Good. Is, yeah, it should be really interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> But um, so we have the new Mill Creek, and then we have the crazy venture on um, at the, the Barrel P Mill Pond. Yes. Well, before that, yes. you, you skipped over the uh, uh, the site that's now on the golf course. Right. 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 <clears throat> which um, was a, a relatively small grist mill, apparently. Um, run by a family and continued in use as we mentioned earlier until uh, 1870s or 1880s at least. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately when they built the golf course they survived, they, they took some of the millstones and put them up on a hill in a little pile. And, but the, the creek uh, geography has been altered quite a bit. So it's a little hard to see exactly where the mill was and so on. And of course, all along there, there's all that evidence of brick making. Right, and the brickyard, yeah. And the brickyards. Yeah. Yes. And a neat picture of a tugboat pulling a barge load of bricks going through the draw on Sewell's Bridge. It must have been a bit of a dicey maneuver. There was a center draw. And, uh, it was at, at the end. Oh, okay. Okay. That's why there are two towers, or is it just one tower, that they stuck on the new bridge. Yeah. There's a sort of a memorial to when it was a draw. Right, right. <clears throat> so that was the only bridge that they had to go through, I suppose, right, at that point? Yes. Yeah. Right. And then, of course, the venture in uh, Barrel Mill Pond. Yes. Which we do know quite a bit about, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. We know a lot more about how it was built and operated, and who made money out of it, uh, where their houses were, uh, or mansions in some cases, yeah. um, what it did for the trade in York, um, the complicated relationships between the Sayward family and the Barrel family, which get quite complex. <laughs> and uh, we know less about its subsequent history, the adaptive reuse. And uh, of course, the fact that it's now an important part of our town infrastructure is a wonderful example of adaptive reuse. One of the things we push in industrial ecology, is you don't throw away resources that you had, reuse them. And uh, so that's a really nice example of uh, how that was done. Yeah, yeah. And it, it was one of the longest dams. <clears throat> The, the barrel mill. Yes. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and then there's the interesting story about the ice pond. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> the ice pond venture. Huh? The ice pond venture. <laughs> we didn't get the salt water out, so the ice wasn't any good. <laughs> you know, when when uh, I see water freezes, the the uh, brine goes into little droplets. And so if you're you're using it for your drinking water in the West Indies, you don't want salt in your water. So that was one of the reasons it didn't work very well. But it must, it must have been quite a hub there with the railroad station and the trolley crossing and the, and, uh, and the uh, ice operation. Yes, there was the ice operation and the, uh, the uh, ice houses that were never used that you see in the older pictures. Right. And uh, the attempt to make the dam watertight which didn't seem to work very well, but apparently it went through several iterations. And eventually um, there was, uh, uh, people used it as a route to get to the golf course. 
And so, you know, why didn't they go through town? Hmm. Well, there's some wonderful old pictures, well, not old, but early, uh, early 20th century, century pictures of York. And there, it's a dirt road. There's a trolley track going down it. Right. It looks like it might have been a very adventuresome ride because it's a pretty wiggly track. And then there's older houses in back, and they clearly are in a state of decay. Hmm. So you can kind of understand why the, uh, the wealthy visitors from York Harbor wanted to avoid the village so they could come down, walk across the mill dam, and go on their way to the golf course without encountering the village. Uh -huh. It seems to be one of the reasons that the dam went through a success of iterations from ice dam to pathway to now local York amenity. Yeah. It's a neat story. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it is remarkable how that tide mill dam was repurposed uh, once unsuccessfully, then successfully as a walkway, and then as uh, the causeway, which we have today with the Wiggly Bridge. And a, a, a great attraction for all York residents. Yes. Yeah. Right. They even named the distillery after it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the Wiggly Bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, was that? Do you think that? Um, I don't remember if that dam is in the same location as the original dam, the dam we see today. Uh, I think it certainly is. Oh, okay. Because it was successively rebuilt. Uh huh. And I think it's true that the original mills, there was a sawmill and a gristmill there are where the Wiggly Bridge is. And the reason it was on that end was that you had a good connection going inland for wagons coming down with uh, either grain or wood to be sawn. So they would have come down Lindsay Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, of course, is the reason why there's a tavern partway down Lindsay Road, now uh, a, a house. Mm -hmm. And so very convenient for the Teamsters who were going to that location oh, yeah. delivering, right? So, and that um, the dam, of course, served as a cross, a way for people to get across the mouth of um, the, the mill pond, Barrels Mill Pond. Hmm. And um, I think there's a nice story about uh, uh, some of uh, Sayward's relatives being trapped on this side in a storm and they managed to make it across uh, the dam in order to get to his house. Hmm. And you see, um, <clears throat> almost monthly now, you see water over the top of that dam now. Yes. Do you think that's with traditional or, or more due to sea level rise? Well, certainly sea level rise is contributing to it, but uh, storm surges probably would have overtopped the dam fairly regularly in the past. Uh, Sayward's diary has some comments about damage done by uh, winter storms. So um, it's an ongoing problem. The first connection to York Harbor on the Colonial Kittery and Brave Boat Harbor Road going north was at this point, which we'll call Seabury. The critical passage over the York River was just beyond at Sewell's Bridge, which, by the way, happened to be Maine's oldest bridge. And right here is one of those many mills indicated in the 1794 map of all the towns in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. As I wandered around the site, I found the remnants of a dam structure about 100 yards upstream from the actual outlet of Southside Brook into York Harbor. Coincidentally, the site of the dam is adjacent to Route 103, if you know where to look. Was this a tide mill? Was this a stream mill using the Southside Brook? Tide Mill Institute keeps finding more sites where a hybrid technology was used. Let the tide in for power, but also use the freshwater stream to impound even more water power. We don't know yet. But there is more history to be unearthed in deeds and records, and I encourage all who are interested in our history to dig into this information. But there is more to this special place.
The York Harbor and Beach Railroad that became the Boston and Maine was completed in the months of June and July 1887. By then, the mill didn't exist because they built a new culvert for water that would have destroyed the mill pond. Ten years after the railroad was built, the 1897 trolley line Kittery and York Electric Railroad was completed. This trolley line was a much shakier construction than the railroad, and they crossed just beyond the Seabury Dam. There's still a footing for the old trolley overpass at the site of Route 103, and there still remains a small stone tablet memorializing the location of Seabury Station. So why are we interested in tide mills? It's always fun to see more than meets the eye. If we see an odd landform in nature, we don't know what it is. If we see an old map marked mill, we don't know what it looks like today. But put them together and history becomes visible. And especially if any mill objects are found, we can start to imagine a picture of the past. These remnants are the oldest remaining European built structures in our built environment. And they represent some fascinating aspects of our past. The American immigrants from Europe were able to innovate with local resources to create community-based energy, food, fabric, and building materials. So when you see an odd collection of stones, timbers, or boards in or near the water, look twice. It might be a tide mill. Many years ago, there was an old Tidewater grist mill on the York River, nearly a mile above Sewell's Bridge on the east side. I don't know when it was built, probably more than a century ago. But over a half century ago, it was conducted for a long time by my uncle Josiah Fernald. As a boy, I would row up in my boat to get cornmeal or buckwheat flour for at least two families at the harbor. If memory serves accurately, the miller's charge, or toll for grinding, was a sixteenth part of the grain brought in. He could get cash by selling his toll, which was kept in well-worn wooden bins. A great wooden wheel with heavy rope attached was the means for lifting the bags from downstairs up to the storage loft above. And we boys loved to sneak a ride on it. The old mill has long since fallen and no farmer comes with corn to grind. But the ocean water still continues to rush in and out with every flood or ebb tide. My, what appetizing barley cakes were made from the freshly ground barley grain. And no meal made from Western corn ever could equal that ground from our own New England corn by men like Uncle Josiah. <laughs> 